Okay, we'll start with the introductions. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Emily Riley. Thank you for being here. I'm the Director of Public Engagement at Bar Graduate Center, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to this evening's program. I am a white woman with curly brown hair. I'm wearing a beige blouse and I'm sitting in front of a white backdrop. Um, while we have the privilege of convening virtually today, we also have the responsibility to acknowledge that many cities and institutions in America were founded on the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose land, Manahata, from which we are hosting this event this evening. The land of the five boroughs that make up New York City are the traditional homelands of the Lenape, Merrick, Canarsie, Matinecock, and Rockaway nations. Despite systemic erasures, these lands persist as intertribal trade lands under the stewardship of many nations and over 115,000 intertribal Native American, First Nations, and Indigenous peoples who currently call New York City home. In addition, I would like to acknowledge those whose ancestors did not arrive on these lands of their own free will and whose tremendous cultural, economic, and technological contributions continue to provide the foundation for our lives. So thank you for being here. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping points. Um, you can enable closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. It should be a little uh, box with two CCs in it if you'd like to have uh, live AI captions. We invite you to submit questions throughout. You can do that using the Q&A function and there'll be time at the end for us to address all of your questions as they come through. Um, this program is a collaboration with Dr. Gregory Shalette, who's a New York based artist, writer, activist and curator of Imaginary Archive a peripatetic collection of documents speculating on a past whose future never arrived. His art and research theorize and document issues of collective cultural labor, activist art, and decolonial historical representation after 1968. You can read more about Gregory's many achievements in the bio that I'll post in the chat in a moment, and also his website, which I will also post in the chat. Greg is going to be our guide through this conversation with our amazing um, participants. And thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Greg. Thank you, Emily. Everybody can hear me OK? Yeah, good. Um, thank you, Emily. And thank the, thank the Grant Center for, for this wonderful invitation. Um, we're going to just I'm going to introduce our, our terrific panelists, uh, each with their own bio and then uh, have a few words before we let each of them make some presentations, eight to 10 minutes about projects that they see fitting into this kind of framework. And after that, we'll have some discussion amongst ourselves. And then it'll be open for Q&A for, for everyone out there. And Emily will be sort of like running that part of it. But um, the first person to, to speak will be Nandini Bagchi, who is an associate professor at the Spitzer School of Architecture in the city. College of New York, and that's Cooney. Uh, she's also the principal of Bagchi Architects, and her built work and writing have been published in the New York Times, Interiors Now uh, Journal, Urban Omnibus, and the Journal of Architectural Education. She's a recipient of grants from the Graham Foundation, New York State Council of the Arts, Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, and her research-based design work involves ongoing engagement with politically active organizations such as the Western Queens Community Land Trust, Interference Archive, Cooperation Jackson, and the Laundromat Project. Her research focuses on activism and architecture and the ways in which bottom-up collaborative political and building practices provide an alternative medium for the creation of public space. Uh, Nandini is the author of Counter Institution, Activist Estates of the Lower East Side, Fordham Press. And if you don't have a copy of the book, Order it right now, even if you get distracted from our panel, because it's just a wonderful, it's not just a wonderful read and a terrific research project, but it's just beautifully done. It's beautiful, beautiful graphics and something you really want to uh, actually have as a real book. I'm also happy to say that she's a colleague of mine at the City University, and she's on the advisory uh, board of our new Andrew W. Mellon funded social practice CUNY initiative. Uh, along with uh, that Chloe Bass and I uh, co-direct. 
So Nandini will be the first to speak, but let me then also now introduce Libertad so we can move more, more smoothly later. Libertad O'Guerrera is an urban uh, anthropologist, curator, cultural organizer, and cultural producers, producer with 15 years of experience in arts management. Her academic, academic research focused on uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Latinx and New York City social artistic movements and cultural activism within immigrant urban settings. Several of her projects have been recognized as best exhibition of the year by ArtNet, as well as one of the 10 galleries to visit in the list by the New York Times. In 2020, Libertad became the executive director of the Clemente so uh, Soto Valles Cultural and Education Center in downtown Manhattan. And that was also recently awarded an Andrew W. Mellon Foundation grant for a new director's vision. Um, Libertad is also a founder, a co-founder of the South Bronx Unite Environmental Justice Coalition and serves as a board member of the Mott Haven Port Morris Community Land Stewards Organization, which is also in the South Bronx. And uh, yeah, as you, as you can tell already, people are wearing People wear a lot of hats in, in this particular group. Todd A. Young uh, is a multimedia, me, uh, multimedia transdisciplinary cultural worker. Originally from Trinidad and Tobago, his practice focuses on political and autobiographical themes and his work and research has been exhibited internationally. He is a founding member of the Repo History Collective. Uh, we were together in that particular group. He sits on the steering committee for the New York City's People, People's Cultural Plan, and he's a member of the Asian American Arts Network known as Godzilla, which recently withdrew from the Museum of Chinese and America's planned retrospective dedicated to the group's activism in an act of protest against the, the museum, Museum of Chinese and America's complicity with and rece receipt of money from the New York City Interborough Rikers Island Emplacement Jail Plan. Um, so lots of things here, intersections of art, intersections of activism, intersections of research. And uh, you're gonna find it's very rich with all of the speakers that we have. So I would like to start actually in an odd, what might seem like an odd place somewhere in the 1990s. I think it's the early 1990s. And I'll put the quote that I'm gonna read in the chat so that it can be shared. This is actually Professor Lawrence Lessing. Uh, he's of course a professor, Harvard Law professor, and he's written books such as, you know, Code and the Laws of Cyberspace, Remix, Making Art and Commerce, Thrive in the Hybrid Economy. And he's often associated with that kind of gleeful, enthusiastic moment of the early uh, moment when it seemed like the internet was gonna save democracy. Here's a quote from that early period of time by uh, Lawrence Lessing, quote, digital technology could enable an extraordinary range of people, uh, ordinary people to become part of a creative process. Technology could enable a whole generation to create remixed films, new forms of music, digital art, new kind of storytelling, writing, a new technology for poetry, criticism, political activism, and then through the infrastructure of the internet, share that creativity with others. I think it was really during this period of the 1990s that the sort of well-intentioned pro-democracy activists really rode the enthusiasm uh, of two intersecting phenomena. First was the end of the Cold War, of course, coming down the wall and so on and so forth, the end of the Soviet Union. And the second was the emergence of a publicly accessible internet. This was when the first, uh, you know, agencies for actually getting onto the internet were, were devised. To be. Uh, believing there was a great belief that these historical conditions uh, were going to allow for a kind of collective, a new kind of collective liberation. And I want to put the emphasis here on the idea of democracy and collectivism, because that is, those are really the themes that Emily asked me to organize this panel around. Uh, what we know now, some two or three decades after the so-called end of history, and of course, referring to Francis Fukuyama there, is that a tacitly enforced mechanical collectivization hides in plain sight. Now, tap your credit card, log into your Instagram or Gmail accounts, join in an online Zoom webinar, webinar like this, 
And in each and every instance, your eye conceals an involuntary belongingness, uh, a seemingly individual subscription that binds you to a kind of emptied out version of we, or more specifically, it inserts you into the broader spectacle of consumerism. This is in other words, a process of collectivization organized by processes of marketing and data mining. It is generally disassociative, seeking to stimulate desires, track the movement of consumption and shadow our bodies in a search for patterns of extraction. At the same time, municipalities and law enforcement are learning to monitor everything from our travel to reading habits using similar profiling methodologies and technologies. The question this leaves us with is this, how does such an intensely self-alienated we marshal resistance against these kind of conditions? It's especially challenging when uh, we have to acknowledge that our isolated togetherness is the result of the same technological advances in network human communications that we, that we hope to use to, to organize in many cases and which also exploit us. The projects that our amazing panelists will discuss in the next hour and a half are not going necess to necessarily issue, uh, address issues with cyberspace or data mining or affect extraction in a direct way they're entitled to do so, but instead they will revolve and uh, focus instead around concrete, imaginative, and often spatialized examples of self-organization that push back against sequential and disassociative modes of automatically generated collectivism in order to reach for other forms, spaces and arrangements of social cooperation uh, that operate on the margins or in conflict with what I've described here as a kind of mechanically enforced collectivism. In other words, uh, reaching for a kind of self-organized collectivism against the very mechanisms that sort of force us into a, a more serialized or sequential collectivism. So with that, let me please uh, again introduce and welcome Nandini Bagchi, who will be followed by Libertad Guerrera and Todd A. Young, and looking forward to the conversation afterwards. Nandini, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Greg. Thanks for inviting us and uh, for getting this panel together. Uh, I have a couple of images of works that I've been engaged in, and I would like to share that. So I'm going to screen share. Um, can everyone see? Yeah, okay. So um, I love the title of this um, discussion, Spaces of Resistance and architecture of repair. And I would like to begin by really talking about how, I, I'm gonna talk a lot about physical space, not about cyberspace. <laughs> uh, I'm an architect and I teach architecture at the Spitzer School. And I've been, um, you know, watching like we all have all the recent marches, street occupations and the collective movements that are in resurgence and the ways in which this idea of public space keeps uh, re-entering into our collective imaginations. This space of appearance, uh, a phrase coined by Hannah Arendt describes the, the importance of a visible public sphere where bold deeds and um, democratic will is exercised. And so this position holds open space in a city with high in high regard. It prioritizes parks, squares, and streets. Um, however, uh, the kind of space that I'm really interested in talking about today is, is something that is often hidden from public view, but it is equally important to, to the kind of enactment of democracy. This space could be an office, a workshop, or building, where organizers, activists, and communities meet to organize and plan what often look like impromptu actions on the street. So this invisible sphere of public participation is equally important, I would say, for the formation of political action. Um, I wanna just talk a little bit about this building. 
which from 1969 to 2000, 2018 was a place where demonstration marches and social justice campaigns were launched. Uh, it's a building that Greg himself spent a lot of time in, probably also Todd knows about this building. Um, and it was nicknamed the Peace Pentagon. It was the unofficial headquarters for the peace and justice movement in New York City. In 2009, uh, an impending MTA project on the subway station below the building led to the revelation of a structural problem in the building, one that would require a substantial amount of money to remediate. And so as the owners of this building considered the sale and relocation, a group of us, tenants, well-wishers, people who had been part of the history of this long history of this uh, activist organizing building, got together to find ways of how they could save the building. So we, uh, meaning me and a couple of other people who were involved in this group, involved in architecture competition. We got a lot of entries. The idea was, you know, what could a peace and justice center in New York City in downtown Manhattan look like if we had, in the event that we would have to tear this building down and build anew. So um, we got a lot of entries for this exhibit and we, look, we uh, found various venues around that neighborhood, public locations, so to speak, a library, a bookstore, a collectively run art gallery. And we displayed many of these entries in these, um, these other spaces that were similarly threatened by escalating real estate values and a crumbling stock of ill-maintained properties. So it was through this negotiation for the venues for this exhibit that I discovered that the Lower East Side provides a hidden infrastructure of social support of all these physical spaces uh, spread throughout uh, through time that is vital to the sustenance of this type of organizing and active activism within the city. Um, my book, which was mentioned earlier, Counter Institution Activist Estates of the Lower East Side grew out of this endeavor to, you know, finding these spaces and locating these networks. And within the book, I examined the histories of various activist run buildings in the Lower East Side uh, from the 1970s onwards to the present um, with, the, with the background of, of specific political and economic crises and how they came into place. So radical movements and counter institutions have historically formed a bulwark against the recurring cycles of real estate speculation, something that um, as a practitioner, as a practicing architect, I'm often you know, um, forced to, to contend with. And this real estate speculation is also a part of the long history of the city. This is not new. However, in uh, the 1970s, there was an economic downturn. It led to large scale disinvestment and abandonment uh, of the city. And it turned once vibrant neighborhoods into veritable ghost towns. Uh, as landlords stopped paying taxes and the city became the owner of a large number of rundown properties, uh, people within neighborhoods such as these, this is a photograph taken by Marley Smumber in the Lower East Side were uh, the people disproportionately impacted by this state of the city were the poorer minority populations in this case, the Puerto Ricans that called it home. Um, however, in a certain sort of twisted way, this, this state of affairs generated new forms of agency and civic purpose. And a lot of self-organized housing groups, poets, performers, artists, guerrilla, gardeners transformed the vacant um, and sort of broken down streets of the city as well as the city owned abandoned properties into places that fostered participation. So in the same spirit of DIY, DIY urbanism, a group of young Puerto Ricans formed a collective called Charas and they worked with the architect Buck Minister Fuller to build geodesic domes on vacant lots in the Lower East Side. Uh, over the next couple of decades, beginning in the 1970s, they built a series of these domes 
which were used for festivals, as greenhouses, and as shelters. So this kind of dome that is often associated with the kind of dropout culture of white suburban um, America became in the hands of Charas, a highly charged symbol of a progressive movement towards sustainable urban practices. So this was their special contribution in a way um, to, to the, the, the concept of this geodesic dome. The space-based movement of Puerto Rican self-sufficiency was part of a larger citywide and nationwide civil rights movement spearheaded uh, by the Young Lords. The Young Lords were extremely effective in the ways in which they organized and used civil disobedience tactics as they advocated for health, food, housing, and education. So the legacy and memory of the activism is embedded often because it was such a space-based activism in buildings such as these, the Lincoln Deep Talk Center in the South Bronx. Uh, uh, it, in, within this building, a group of doctors, nurses, and psychiatrists with direct ties to the Young Lords initiated a radical program for drug treatment. They pioneered the use of acupuncture as an alternative to methadone to cure addiction. And this building uh, became an important center for, for the community and for the movement. So the closure of this facility uh, in 2012 by the health department came as a real blow to the community that lived around there. Uh, a group of local activists, South Bronx Unite, we have one of them here with us today, Libertad Guerra, galvanized in the desire to reopen this historic building and turn it into a community center. In 2016, I met some of the members of this group, Michael, Corinne, Moncho, and Libertad, uh, and I was extremely interested in sort of joining their work and in this project to reopen this building and turn it into something that would become once again a part of their community. So with their blessing, I coordinated a design studio with my students at City College. And we worked for four months in collaboration with many residents and organizers to figure out um, you know, what, what and how we could go about repurposing the Lincoln Detox Center. Uh, we had workshop sessions such as these pictured here, uh, which were conducted you know, informally on picnic benches at Brook Park which is itself a model community space in the South Bronx. We participated in a series of these sessions that began with trying to identify the, the assets and the existing sort of resources of the community, and then went into programming the, the existing three-story building. These very sessions provided the, grand, the grounds for further development of adjacencies within the building and became what, uh, what was then named the HEARTS, i.e. Health Education and Arts Community Center. So in, um, in 2017 or, or thereabouts, Libertad can correct me if I'm wrong. South Bronx Unite formally set up a community land trust, uh, the Mott Haven, Port Morris Community Land Stewards. Uh, Libertad will probably tell you more about this initiative. Uh, they also put together a larger team to work on investigating the scope of adapting this building into the Hearts Community Center. Um, they are currently working on several fronts at this point to uh, to reclaim this building and to acquire it from the city and to turn it into the Hearts Community Center. So I have been very fortunate in my capacity as the architect for the new Hearts building to engage with the community in the South Bronx. And here we are at a summer festival on a hot day in June 2018. Um, seems so far and long ago, but um, the idea of this festival, which happens every year, except I think last year it did not happen, um, right in front of the same building. And the idea is to reclaim the detox center through performance, music, flags, banners, 
And um, here we were, uh, the architects also present at this festival with our Come Apart Hearts Community Center model. And then lastly, I just wanna talk a little bit about this project that I am working on currently um, and really thinking about the space of, and this question of resistance and an architecture of repair, which I feel I engage in um, really often. Uh, I have been working with an extraordinary group of people at an organization called the Laundromat Project to create flexible workspace that supports their work with BIPOC communities uh, to create, gather, make art, and build community, um, as these little banners suggest in this drawing. The question of aesthetics suitable for this undertaking was the topic of many discussions with a cohort of uh, and at the Laundromat Project. Finally, we landed on something that is somewhere in between uh, a space that has its own identity saying, yes, this is the laundromat project while also facilitating the concept of open-endedness um, and participation in the art making processes that will occur once um, they allow and open up the, the, the space to the larger community. So the design of the space allows for that type of flexibility. It's comfortable, it's colorful, there's room to expand into, it's not precious and it's not prescriptive. Uh, so these are sort of some of the ideas we spoke about and also, you know, thinking about how we distinguish what we do here from the other kinds of upgrades and gentrification projects that are ongoing in this very same neighborhood. So at the same time, we did, we did want to take a somewhat strong stance. We didn't want it to have uh, no personality. Uh, and we discussed the idea of being somewhat fearless at the same time, open-ended. Um, so here's just a drawing that I'm gonna end on. Uh, after a year of repairing, fixing and repurposing, the space is ready to welcome the community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadine. That, that was just terrific. Um, wow. Uh, talk about spatialization of issues around uh, repair aesthetics and fearless aesthetics all at once. Uh, up next, Libertad. You've been mentioned. You've already been mentioned many times. It's wonderful <laughs> to have you come next. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Nandini. Um, so um, Nandini is an architect. I'm an anthropologist. So I've been thinking about the title and of symbols and tropes. Um, and I, I will open with this question. Why the architecture of repair and not the architecture of reparations? Repair to bring back together at its root, something was whole and then became separated. So why try to make it, we, we try to make it whole again, right? and resistance to hold back at its root. A force is exerting pressure and we hold it back. Back, it sounds a bit reactionary, like all the newsletters and email alerts professing Black Lives Matter, Asian Lives Matter, I believe her, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, just now, reacting. So these days, every run of the mill New York liberal is for equity, remembrance, disability, at least nominally. There is lots of noise of social capital and social capital around these tropes, yet equity landscape changes at a painfully slow pace. It is so difficult to take words seriously and respect for the ideas that give birth to symbols. Symbols, visual, textual, or architectural should be firmly anchored in values-based uh, uh, outcomes um, rather than used as, as references to be occupied as floating signifiers. So any talk of resistance, I think needs to be paired or repaired uh, with the will to construct and giving form to something uh, that is what actually uh, pertains to this field of aesthetics that, that we're also embedded with, of not being cynical, of staying solely in the oppositional field. I think Gramsci called it uh, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will resistance without a concrete reparations project in my estimation equals a fetish of life in the trenches giving way to 
what Walter Benjamin wanted, uh, warned us about, which was the aesthetization of politics as opposed to the politicization of arts, uh, which I, I think all the projects that we're uh, mentioning here today are about. That's usually what uh, gives rise to fascist re regimes. So projects are collectives. Collectives are projects, at least most of the time. I like to reflect on these matters. I like to pause and, and take stock on them because um, most of all, I like to act and preferably within a collective setting to advance our agenda in very concrete spaces. So let me go into some of those things that I'm currently involved. Um, definitely activist estates, Nandini's uh, exhibit. Uh, I was so honored to uh, co-produce with her, this uh, bringing the book into exhibit form. And this is still an ongoing project as we are working on a digital version as a resource. Um, this is an evolving story towards reparation, I believe, and what it looks like when we equitably construct canonical narratives, when we bridge timeline and space to visualize the overlaps of artificially segregated movements. When we, um, that's I believe what uh, Nandini's work and especially when she translated it into exhibition form um, managed to do. Um, she, uh, we, there's an angle of cultural organizing to come with uh, th those questions that redefine the transactional algorithm of coveted space and that, uh, that flesh out the plight of community control into a for what rather than a slogan uh, in and of itself, like uh, I was talking at the beginning. So her project, it's really uh, uh, about showing communities defined by their practices and non-traditional expertise, not a static or rigid definitions. And it really recognizes the interdependent uh, dynamics of place, its design along with the cultural bearers of that place and the array panoply of shared purpose and meaning. Uh, as mentioned before, I, and, and it overlaps directly with the epicenter of the Lower East Side uh, and, uh, and actually a, a bearer of Charas, which is an example that Nandini mentioned. I'm now directing the, the Clemente Sotoveles Cultural Center. Um, even this building <laughs> uh, was designed by the same architect that Charas was, BJ Snyder. It's a, it's a beautiful building. Um, uh, that houses four theaters and, and two galleries and multiple artist spaces. Um, and it, it's, a, it's one of those places that flesh out our democracy in, in the way Dandini just defined it, which is not just about public space, as important as that, that is, but inter interior space for organizing, for collectivism, for, for ac accessibility. Um, our center was named after a political prisoner, poet and activist who in the 40s spent a decade in federal prison because of his struggle for Puerto Rico's independence. When Clemente came out of federal prison, he moved to New York. He spent the rest of his life in New York City fighting for worker rights, human rights, and the rights of immigrants as the Cointelpro uh, was going full speed in the island, not just in here with the Black Panthers and the, and the Young Lords, but also in the island of Puerto Rico. He died in the early 90s when this center was being founded and, and appropriated uh, as another abandoned school. And he left behind an institutional, journalistic, and artistic legacy. The Clemente Center founding was, uh, was by Puerto Rican and Latino artists and cultural activists whose vision for cultural expression was rooted in a multiracial, multi-ethnic, and transdisciplinary coalition. So to well as that, uh, Sotovel's death, which happened in, at the time, um, gave, uh, obviously the, the building was named after him uh, in honor because one of the co-founders in that collective was Ed Vega, who was also a poet. Uh, the multi-positional and place-based ethos and governance of this new project, this new cultural center, created a highly unique model that helped pluralize the shape of, the shape of contemporary art. Um, Right now, many people talk about inclusivity, diversity, inclusion. So, uh, th but this is from you know from the from the point of the establishment. This was already doing that very presciently uh, at a parallel level. At the same time, different uh, intentions around racial equity mirrored that dynamics in the neighborhood itself when it became a symbol of the alternative art scene, ground zero for gentrification. I mean the area and. Um, as well as 
the false opposition dynamics of the East Village ethos that we are very familiar with, with usually meaning white art, anarchy, squatting, academic knowledge, versus the Loisida ethos, which usually means brown, diasporic culture, sweat equity, homesteading, vernacular knowledge. Activist states, uh, Nandini's book goes uh, a bit into that, uh, and the exhibit highlighted uh, what I think it's a, it's a false opposition. Um, and I think that's a great contribution that Nandini's work did um, because it crumbled and crumbled uh, 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 the narrative that segregates those movements and, and showed the overlaps between them in precisely in the space of the Lower East Side. So the priorities for my vision um, as, as leader of the Clemente are, yes, definitely to safe keep the, the Clemente as one of the, the few statewide city back models for cultural equity and workspace affordability and store that, you know, that publicly owned facility um, because it's, it's just given uh, access to so many to so many emergent artists and cultural producers and organizers uh, without you know, much credit at all. I, I constantly hear people telling me, oh, you know, <laughs> that was one of the first shows I ever produced was at the Clemente. That actually is my story as well. I even produced uh, shows there like 20 years ago. Uh, another priority is to create a space and platform for social and embodied processes rather than cyclical discursive positions staying away of the tropes and, and, and symbols, explore projects on, on the themes of migration and colonialism, but not as an ethnic confine, more as themes that are part of the infinite history of humanity. It's, it's, it, it doesn't belong solely to us. <laughs> Approach community as an action that prefigures other coming communities. To do re dress rehearsals for future societies to place artists and communities in proximity within a physical space so we can temporarily suspend the notion of being at the margins into sites of possibilities. And to avoid uh, having artists of color become a specimen or a native informer easily processed into the threat victim dichotomy or the right le left spectrum, but as someone that can inflict joy, even weirdness or strangeness in, 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 into the world by making our social relationships a bit more palpable. I'm going to transition very briefly into two other projects that I'm housing at Clemente, but overlap into other neighborhoods. As uh, I live in the South Bronx, as, as was mentioned, um, the, the LES and the South Bronx have been culturally entwined through its cultural movements and art scenes, at least since from Fashion Moda um, onwards. Just the demographics, the footprint of Na Naisha, the, the, obviously the quintessential music genres that evolved from both of them, the echo urban pioneering, the squads, the community gardens, many ties uh, between activists back in the 80s remain active today. And they actually link to Puerto Rico where since the fiscal crisis and principally after Maria, there's been a world building impulse mostly led uh, by Puerto Rican uh, workers of color in the island who are appro appropriating abandoned schools, expansive mutual aid efforts that very much draw explicit inspiration and pay homage to the Loisida heyday of place-based activism of the 70s and 80s. This community um, as practice ethos is currently reflected in the work that we're doing at uh, the Mott Haven Port uh, Morris um, CLT or what locally called the South South Bronx <laughs> CLT, which was spur, uh, spurheaded uh, spur by um, SBU, South Bronx Unite. Um, our collective efforts vie to serve as a shadow government in our council district in the South Bronx. It is based on the principles of environmental justice, abolitionism, reparations, and stewardship. We are everything our governments have been incapable of being. Our very existence is an indictment of the governments that are sworn to serve and protect us and that have made a profession of failing us, especially in the South Bronx, which is a symbol of that. While our governments have mostly sponsored the despoliation and dependence of our communities, Robert Moses, redlining, mass incarceration, record-breaking asthma, we are all about self-determination, urban development from the ground up 
that was the example of hearts that Nandini mentioned and that we she she came and collaborated with us to make a truly from the ground up urban development that was community vetted and we are lobbying the city to this day for them to transfer that abandoned building that was has a history from the young lords to give it over to the community uh, to for this uh, community vetted plan that was done collectively. Um, and finally, I will transition uh, to a last um, example that we're also uh, uh, involved in uh, about monetary policy. Um, part of the hidden dynamics that must be understood and left behind is uh, monetary policy, interest, profits are all mysterious things as we know, how money works and why, uh, how it is distributed, how it moves around. We are all over determined by this, but understand very little of it. So another collective determination uh, effort that I'm involved in is called Just Exchanges. It's another collective community currency project uh, piloted by um, workers, cultural workers of color, both in the Lower East Side and Mott Haven. And the idea is to extract interest and profit from some of our exchange transactions supporting local businesses, establishing lateral working partnerships not mediated by the dollar. It is a very pretty radical, but also very extremely pragmatic effort to limit the, circu um, the circulating life of the dollar within our daily lives. So I'll leave it to Todd now. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Libertad. Uh, a lot of rich material there to go over, especially like this idea of the shadow government uh, being sort of enabled by these kind of spaces in the in the margins that are sort of you know growing and stre and strengthening by act acting on specific spaces and I think that's something that everyone here really has in common this idea of not just a theoretical model but something that's actually put into place and I know that's certainly true about our next and last speaker Todd A Young Todd. Un you have to unmute Todd. Oh, too much uh, Zoom teaching, getting all of this stuff. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Greg Chalette. Thank you, uh, Emily. Um, thank you, Bar College, for the invitation. Um, this is going to be a hard act to follow because I didn't um, actually have a formal presentation. I thought I was going to be responding to uh, uh, questions. Um, so what I'm, what I'm going to do is to um, take on something to the effect that um, uh, at a recent, um, uh, let's, okay, let's back up a little bit to Greg's quote. Um, so when he was uh, uh, reading that quote about digital technology um, and the coming down of the wall, uh, I was writing that um, with the, the coming down of the Berlin Wall uh, and the erection of a digital wall. So that's pretty much what um, kind of started to take place, right? Because or only certain people um, were able to have access to that uh, worldwide internet. Um, as we were also emptied out by the we, right? Um, we also started to become um, more visible, um, certain uh, people, because we started to be tracked. Um, and to use uh, the phrase from uh, um, uh, Deleuze, uh, in a kind of a society of control that became even more prevalent. Um, and this kind of data mining um, is also um, becomes all sort of prevalent. It also, I find that it's um, uh, it's also pretty prevalent within the academy um, that there's a, a lot of data mining going on in terms of what one uh, um, decides to uh, sort of uh, present and uh, communicate. Right? Um, we've gotten into this. Um, this habit of um, not really um, creating an embodied knowledge, um, which I think uh, is really important to get back to, as opposed to uh, a kind of um, an archival knowledge. Um, and so, an embodied knowledge that um, that is uh, uh, that is uh, um, pertinent and relevant uh, to the context uh, that we that we're interacting with. Um, in terms of what uh, the two panelists uh, were saying, I'm interested. Um, so just get to get back uh, into that embodied knowledge a little bit. Um, I've been involved with lots of collectives uh, since I uh, um, landed back in New York City. Uh, you know, going from uh, Trinidad to um, uh, to LA, uh, being brought up there. 
Um, and that kind of um, that experience of, of being an immigrant in LA in the 1970s during a depression was also pretty impactful to my kind of um, my uh, worldview about um, uh, what it means to be in the United States as opposed to being in the Caribbean. Um, and uh, not that um, in that particular embodiment that um, uh, racism, colorism, and, and all those other aspects of uh, uh, colonial history uh, doesn't exist. It just sort of existed, uh, um, I think, in more intensely um, uh, being an immigrant, uh, a brown immigrant in, in LA. And then coming back to New York, um, that sort of informed my um, my kind of uh, my uh, actions and uh, trajectory and falling into the art world accidentally, literally, because I don't have, um, my parents are, you know, not um, coming from any of that background uh, at all. And also uh, starting to, to uh, accrue knowledge through uh, books was also something that came pretty late because we didn't, uh, we had a very minimal library. So most of my embodiment um, uh, was based on uh, kind of an oral history. Um, and so coming to that and then uh, going to art school and then uh, um, interacting um, at the same time uh, as an undergrad at the School of Visual Arts uh, with um, uh, going to the New York Marxist School, uh, which then became the Brecht Forum. Um, and so at that, that um, uh, early age as an undergrad, looking for, the, uh, looking for something to, you know, to uh, define uh, a new future was also uh, something that um, became uh, really uh, pertinent, right? Uh, and to, I like this kind of a quote, uh, you probably know that Raul Peck um, recently created a documentary called Exterminate the Brutes, right? Um, and there's a quote that he, uh, during an interview um, in uh, uh, Democracy Now, that he says, the past has a future we cannot anticipate. Um, and so that that kind of, um, you know, we're, we're constantly, I'm in my projects, constantly trying to anticipate um, uh, what this uh, this um, um, uh, future is going to, to be, right? Um, and so some of the projects that I've been working on with various groups has to do with um, not only, um, uh, for example, uh, with Godzilla, um, uh, the network, um, but to try to imagine some sort of alliance, uh, um, intersectional, uh, to use that term, some sort of intersectional alliance between um, uh, various um, uh, um, uh, oppressed groups um, and also addressing issues of, um, you know, uh, um, uh, police brutality, uh, uh, defunding the police, um, uh, colonial, coloniality. Um, so that was, you know, in part what um, Godzilla's withdrawal from MOCA uh, became about, um, because MOCA, um, uh, just to bring you up uh, to speed with that uh, a little bit, um, and there's a really good article that came out in Art Forum uh, by Howie uh, Chin, um, uh, which is a, a, the first installment, um, where he tracks um, the formation of Godzilla and, uh, and some of the the kind of divergence is the, that Godzilla kind of uh, took and the museum became this site of this kind of divergence in a bit, uh, in a way. It was not just a, some of us didn't want it just to be a kind of archiving um, that the museum was um, proposing. Um, we wanted it to be actually engaged with um, what was happening around us because we felt that was a, um, you know, um, those conditions uh, presented a certain emergency and uh, 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 an op, you know an opportunity to to sort of um, engage uh, with uh, contemporary issues, not just uh, just a, a, an archive that they wanted to go through in terms of retrospective. Um, so that became the kind of uh, um, uh, the questioning, and then the questioning got deeper to why the museum um, accepted thirty five million dollars from the city. Uh, uh, you know, um, with a certain transaction having to do with the Plasio, uh, about bringing the interbar uh, inter jail plan um, after the closing of Rikers. Um, so that became uh, an intense um, uh, uh, kind of confrontation with the museum in the sense that MOCA, unlike MoMA, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring up why I brought MoMA into this uh, uh, um, uh, uh, discussion, is, is a very small place. Um, it's a, a place that um, uh, highlights uh, 
um, Chinese American and, and actually in a larger sense, uh, Asian um, uh, American art and accomplishments. Um, and so it does not have the same scale. Um, it doesn't have the same presence, right? It's a struggling uh, museum in many ways. Um, but we felt as a group, um, which we call ourselves uh, um, G10, uh, or it could be G11, we felt that um, the museum needed to uh, acknowledge this money and acknowledge why they took the money, um, under what conditions um, that, you know, this museum was, uh, the, the director felt that they were uh, um, uh, backed into a corner um, because of survival to some extent that they needed to accept this money. Um, we wanted that, um, that, uh, that, that uh, transparency of this transaction. Um, we also wanted a town, a town hall meeting that we were calling for. Um, and um, so the acknowledgement uh, turned into, of, of this money turned into something to the effect that um, uh, the museum already uh, since 2008 um, has rejected jails. Um, uh, and so they, they put up a little thing on, on their website, kind of um, hit it a bit. <laughs> it was really hard to find. Um, and that was as much as, as what the museum wanted to do. Um, they didn't want to have a town hall. They didn't want to have a, a, a kind of a people's forum because they felt that that was um, unproductive because they've done that in the past. They didn't want to be in this situation, which made no sense to us um, in terms of, you know, this is a museum that's, uh, that has its roots um, from the basement workshop from the, uh, you know, the, that was originally a, um, uh, um, a research project. Um, uh, in the 70s, uh, 69 it started uh, and then became the basement workshop um, in 1970, um, a kind of hub for activism, um, activist art. Um, and, you know, eventually uh, some of the, you know, it uh, sort of sort of spilled over to the, the founding of uh, MOCA, the Museum of Chinese America yeah, in America. And, and some of those, those founders who had links to the basement workshop has, have been kind of pushed away because they don't, um, they don't, like the direction where the museum's going. So that was, that's become part of this kind of project that um, um, I'm kind of working with. Um, and in relationship to MoMA, um, and I wanna bring up the whole thing about strike um, MoMA. Um, so part of what um, my struggle within this group, and I'm speaking for myself when I say this, is that um, I don't feel, um, and you know, as opposed to the other panelists, which I uh, appreciate those projects, um, I'm almost wanting to um, to have an art strike. <laughs> um, I want to like um, uh, this embodiment makes me want to not to like make more things. Um, you know, create uh, redirections, repair anything. Repair to me, um, uh, you know, it, even though I think it's a, uh, in some sense it it touches on. Audre Lorde's concept of, um, you know, care, um, it's, it's, it's just repairing what was broken, right? And if you take, um, uh, in a sense, um, uh, this uh, article that came out in uh, Hyperallergic, uh, if I can divert a little bit about the, um, uh, the productive aspect of, of destruction right, having to do with monuments, right? It's not about repair. Um, so repair, uh, maybe based on a concept of redirection, uh, maybe that's uh, we can kind of embrace that notion of repair. But the the um, the destruction of that thing maybe is something that needs to be um, uh, you know uh, absorbed and documented. And I think it is being documented and not necessarily being pushed on to some other space where it just becomes a new um, a new uh, kind of a, a reproduction uh, kind of a an alternative model of what was before, even if it's based on community and it's based on um, uh, elements of affirmation, right? Um, and I am in part thinking about um, what will it take to move us on um, beyond the notion of a post-MOMA future, which is what in part, um, um, you know, that strike mocha thing is quite brilliant. Um, and I'm also involved with uh, talking to, uh, Divest um, MoMA. I'm a little concerned that um, that um, it's going to collapse, and this is something that Mocha uh, we discuss uh, into whitewashing, art washing, right? Um, one of the things that uh, Mocha um, talked to us about in terms of when we were kind of pushing back resistance um, is that um, 
they said that we're archiving everything. Even this we're archiving, right? Um, so that's just gonna become part, you know, our resistance is becoming part of the archive of, of the museum, uh, which kind of made us really uh, freak out uh, a bit. And I'm a little worried about the, the archiving aspects of, of all this kind of re re redirection and the notion of a repair. Um, and not really, you know, embracing the the destruction of those things, or even when I say um, call, I think we should have an art strike, is to you know the folks who are will uh, who are able to pull back from museums and galleries in a in a in a really key way, um, and let other people kind of come forth. Um, it might be, what exactly does that look like? Maybe that's something that needs to be talked talked about because um, I, I agree with um, uh, Walter McDolo about um, that. Uh, MoMA and these institutions and a way of uh, creating a built environment um, is um, tied to some sort of, um, you know, it's tied up with this uh, notion of history that's also tied up to, uh, to a notion of the nation state um, and that you have to abandon all these things. Um, and I'm not talking about, you know, going from uh, zero because um, that, that has also detrimental effects. I'm talking about, you know, really dismantling um, in, in uh, and dispersing and abandoning in order to re um, to uh, and I, don't, I won't use the word reimagine that seems to be um, uh, uh, a word that um, I'm not quite exactly sure what to reimagine and what reimagine would be just like I so um, uh, um, I'm suspect of the re word repair I'm a little bit more interested in embracing the word care and well-being um, in terms of trying to move forward. So the space that I'm in is mostly trying to figure out as an embodied, uh, uh, you know, this embodied um, uh, knowledge or experience that I have is just trying to figure out um, where we should go um, from there without falling into a productivist um, model. And um, that part, um, so lots of some other groups I'm involved with is um, trying to work on eco-socialism. I'm actually just joined a, a group in Ithaca, um, a Marxist reading group, which I haven't been part of in, for such a long time. Um, I'm not saying Marxism is the way that we need to go, um, because I think uh, some of the models that we need to approach is that maybe uh, it's a concept of um, uh, Marxism and uh, indigenous knowledge. Do those things go together? I am not sure. That's a big discussion. Um, and one of the discussions that um, I had recently uh, with that was around a, a book um, uh, called In Search of um, African American Space um, that tries to meld in uh, indigenous knowledge as well as um, the, the Black um, uh, um, uh, ref uh, tradition of refusal. And I think um, uh, what I'm, I guess what I'm partially saying is that, that I'm going through a series of refusals. Um, in that kind of um, uh, um, a black tradition of practice, right? And I just want to read a quote um, uh, from um, Tina M. Camp about uh, called Constellations of Freedom, Assembly, Reflection, and Repose. As I have argued elsewhere, the practice of refusal rejects status quo as livable and refuses to recognize a social order that renders black people worthless and expendable. It is a refusal to embrace the terms of diminished subjecthood with which we are presented and, utilize, and utilizing negation as a generative and creative source of disorderly power that allows us to embrace the possibility of living otherwise. The practice of refusal is also a space-making intervention, one that reclaims and embraces the space of the quotidian to create new possibilities in the face of negation. So I think, um, you know, I, I, that's where I am with a lot of these groups. I am just um, in that space of refusal in, uh, in terms of art practice. I mean, I've made so many objects, I've made so many things with groups, and I just want to refuse <laughs> um, just adding more onto that. And I think part of that refusal is also that shift that Greg talks about from the coming down of the wall to the building of this digital wall, which becomes a kind of society of control. And I feel that um, a lot of what um, where we're going as artists, um, I can't speak for anthropologists or architects. Um, I, it feels that there needs to be um, a rethinking of just wanting to, um, you know, uh, be creative and reproduce things uh, and make things uh, again. Uh, because I think um, um, what we also need to to think about um, in terms of um, 
uh, uh, what Lebetard was talking about, uh, uh, about value is that, uh, and then getting back to Marx is that um, we really need to um, get out of this, um, this uh, mindset of exchange. Um, it should not be about transactional anything. Um, if we want to think about value, it has to be broken down to maybe, um, maybe not, uh, it, we need to rethink about what use value is. Um, we need to get rid of exchange value. We need to get rid of uh, notions of surplus. Um, and this is part of the, the economic um, you know, tragedy that we've kind of fallen into of this kind of productivist model. And that could also be to um, blame uh, and um, you know, question aspects of um, how Marxism kind of rolled out. Um, in certain uh, uh, societies that, that, you know, like the Soviet Union or, or China that seems to be uh, knee deep um, in this kind of centralized um, productivist model. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Todd, so much. Thank you, everyone. That was, that was a, a lot of, we covered so much ground. <clears throat> it's like a, an encyclopedia of material here. I'm going to do my best to try to thread some things together so we can continue the discussion. Um, and I think, you know, you brought up some really important, many important things, Todd, but among them, this question of um, your own alternative education, which is sort of fascinating. And I think in, to some degree, we, all of us here have sort of been engaged in a, in a sort of autodidactical self-learning or unlearning things that we were taught and learning new things. Uh, and I think that's kind of the spirit of repair that I think of is it's about sort of like, you know, not necessarily fixing and going back to where things were, but to sort of repairing the gaps and the fissures and the, the things that have been sort of taken out of the possibility of where we are without necessarily fixing that in stone. I mean, it, it needs to remain plastic. And I think that's kind of part of where you were coming from, Todd, especially. I guess maybe we could discuss this for a minute though, this question of the institution has come up again and again. And in different ways, each of you has built institutions or counter institutions as Nandini likes to call them um, in different ways. I find it interesting and it's one of the reasons I started with the Lawrence lesson quote, when we go back to that moment post Cold War 1990s, suddenly it seemed like we could abandon the institution and we could take up the positionality as needed right on, on an interim basis. Um, the kind of practices we saw with tactical media, let's say. Uh, the Yes Men is a good example, you know, and they've done amazing and important work. But one of their strengths is, but maybe also one of the challenges is, you know, they refuse to have a stable identity outside of this sort of synonymous thing, the Yes Men. They keep changing what they are. And that was a central tenet of tactical media as outlined by people like uh, Pierce Loving and David Garcia. Uh, the, tac the tactician doesn't have a place it doesn't defend a place or a space. It doesn't create a space. And that was quite contrary to the kinds of activism that I sort of was involved in in the early, uh, let's say the, the early 1980s, late 70s, and many of the things that uh, both Libertad, Nandini, and Utah have discussed, where we did actually occupy spaces and tried to kind of create some kind of organizational structures. However, fleeting or sort of, uh, you know, piecemeal or bricolage they were. Um, tactical media just seemed to say, no, you know, we don't want to create any kind of institutional structures, right? Precisely because of what you brought up at the end of your presentation, look what happened in China, look what happened in the Soviet Union and so forth. And yet, and this is the point I want to get to, what we've been seeing in the last 10, 15 years is activists, artists, uh, counter administrators, whatever you want to call them, going back to the institution, right? And re, not just the counter institution, but the actual institution and making and demanding changes. So we see this, of course, uh, with Liberate Tate. We see this with Gulf Labor. We saw this with Decolonize the Space, the Anti Candors campaign, on and on, as if somehow that wanting to be on the margins, wanting to create spaces over there, but always fleeting spaces. Now we're gonna go back and occupy the place. You know, we're gonna be like the, uh, you know, the birds that are coming home to roost, right? Uh, right within the center of it. And let me just add one other aspect of this, which is of course, this wave of uh, unionizations that we've seen across the art world's institutions and the big museums, 
uh, all across the US at this point. Uh, it's very interesting that many of those individuals who are working in the institution are themselves products of an art education where they learned about institutional critique, you know, from people like me or even people like of, of the earlier generations like Martha Rosler, Hans Hacke, who's, who I studied with. Um, it's almost as if they're now practicing institutional critique, but not as art projects per se, but within the very institution itself in a completely sort of uh, new sort of approach that I wouldn't even put in the category of institutional critique, except there seems to be a genealogy. So I'm just going to end there with this question of, um, you might say the institution, are we heading back? Are we re rejecting it completely, boycotting it? Are we somewhere in a space that's kind of both of those things at the same time? So uh, maybe um, we'll start again with Nandini. We could go around. Is that all right? Okay. Yeah, thank you. I'm so glad I went first because uh, it feels like there was a like a kind of trajectory where I am, um, you know, I'm a practicing architect and within a, a cohort of like architects, you know, I'm the one let's speak of architecture with a small A and not a capital A, you know, we're still like in some other realm within my own discipline of trying to dismantle a kind of um, hierarchy of like who gets to play architect and those kinds of questions. But um, getting back to this idea of institutions, I'm not sure I can exactly uh, you know, respond to what you're asking, Greg, but you know, we all, we all work within institutions, you know, at City College, Clemente, um, I, I, and Todd as well, we all teach. Or in these committees, um, so that is the like the 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 real that is part of our lives very much. So within those institutions, you know, we have to formulate what sorts of positions we would take. Um, and I do believe that there is a resurgence of a, a movement that is more rooted, at least in my field and in my uh, range of expertise. In the, in the environmental movement is really the strongest, uh, most broadest movement. You know, to me, I'm looking for also a kind of broad movement rather than like this, these sort of atomized entities, um, because I think if anything, the research has shown that as, as being really important as a way to have something that has solidity. Um, and within that, I feel these ideas of care or repair seem to be very prominent and important. You know, like when we talk not on the scale of um, communities or identities or any of those things, if we speak on the scale of the environment, then the words care and all this kind of feminist thinking from back then is really beginning to take new kinds of shapes. And I feel those are perhaps the points at which the institution has to really be challenged. All, all institutions have to be challenged at this intersection of ecology, I would say, and, and us, you know. So to me, I think that's, that is what the, the new, that's what's really prominent and new in the landscape of thinking about the counter institution that at least I, as an architect and uh, as, a, as a practitioner, have to think about in my field as well. It is very interesting, though, to think of it in contrast to sort of the, the sort of Frank Gehry generation of deconstructionism, uh, you know, where the building had to be exploded and pulled apart. Uh, I'm being a little bit literal here, but for a reason, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that we're suddenly now thinking about, well, how do we put things back together again? Mm -hmm. um, Libertad, any thoughts? Well, yeah, um, that's why I referred at the beginning with the architecture of reparations, <laughs> stretching it from repairs. It's, I see that as a redirection, like Todd was saying, because uh, if you're going to talk about that, it, it always implies a, an act of futuring rather than making things one again or whole again. Uh, it needs to be also about recapturing what has been invisibilized. Uh, that's how I see uh, repair. You diversity, um, what has been invisibilized, um, 
begins with names and last names. You can't, you can't bring reparations or repair something to those you can't see or you can't name. So even though we're talking about collectives, you also have to speak with the, about the individual, first names, last names. And, um, and uh, th that also brings me to the point of the nation state that was mentioned, because uh, uh, many times the nation state is about othering, about the, the grand narrative, about us versus the other, that which does not belong, that which is invisibilized, whether it be an institution or nation state, uh, whatever. So collectivism in the way that we're talking about it, in a way that is about self-determination, not about serialization, it's actually about making, giving visibility to something. <laughs> the other type is what makes you invisible and thus makes you broken, ma makes, makes, gives that loss of connection. That's what re repair reparations or a redirection would mean. It's like, how do we add this sense of connection? Because the true brokenness is when you lost connection, be it to your built environment, to your community, to your family, to, to, the, to the lack of visibility that uh, communities of color many times, or those who have been invisibilized, that's what we're trying to repair. So uh, that's where I'm at in terms of all these tropes and things that are missing. I think there's overlaps into everything that we've said. I would just leave it that based on the institution or whatever it is, uh, we have to remember that resistances are always multi-positional and you know, they, they have space for all of us in a way um, and we, you know, making space for others or, or that finding of that connection or of that reparation, uh, it's not necessarily a zero sum game. And that's where we get trapped when we feel like it's us or the other, the identity or the other, and we see it as a zero sum game. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I, 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 but I couldn't help thinking too about what Todd was saying about the idea of uh, wanting to sort of. Uh, sort of vanish. So we have the question of vis making ourselves visible, but maybe also choosing at times to be invi invisible or to choose invisibility. Um, but there's always these two sides to it, as you say. I mean, even with the idea, uh, Todd, of sort of creative destruction, we know capitalism has just traditionally always destroyed everything. Everything solid melts into air, Marx famously said. And yet that melting down process also can sometimes be flipped and used for other kinds of um, purposes, for resistant purposes at times, right? So we have this very complicated game between wanting to repair things that have been destroyed, but also recognizing the value sometimes of getting out of the center or getting out of the light and working from a, from a marginal position maybe. Um, anyway, Todd, I'll turn it over to you. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate um, uh, what folks have been saying, um, I think it's you know it's it's not um, it's not a simple uh, it's not a simple. I mean, institutionalization. I am institutionalized, um, you know, um, uh, in in such a deep way. And I think um, what I appreciated from the recent um, um, and I, I'm not you know I, there. I think there. I think that there are aspects of it that I need to to work through is uh, what Walter McNolo said um, about, um, I mean, besides um, differentiating between de uh, decolonization, which means that you actually have to give back the land um, and decoloniality, which is a more uh, recent thing, which has more to do with this multiverse that um, uh, uh, positioning that, um, that, that uh, McNolo is talking about. Um, and the fact of, um, um, and abandoning is my term, um, so it's not so much um, uh, dismantling. Um, I, yeah, I want to push that word away. That's actually dismantling is something that um, uh, diverse uh, MoMA has spoken about. Um, uh, as I said, I appreciate um, what uh, Strike MoMA, uh, all those groups are doing because I think it's really important. Um, I appreciate what um, you know uh, the group that I belong to, the Godzilla, uh, the G10, is also doing. Um, and I'm involved with all these uh, uh, these collective um, uh, actions and practices, uh, and uh, and also trying to um, you know um, trying to see if I abandon these, what is there to um, you know to to uh, 
replace. And in some sense, uh, this, you know, my embodied sensibility is not to want to replace. And I guess that comes back from my, uh, my interest in, in, um, in uh, um, uh, Nardini said uh, uh, it's specifically around um, uh, environmentalism, because I'm also involved with that um, too. And that's why I'm interested in eco-socialism um, as a possibility, uh, which is a fairly new kind of, uh, kind of bringing together uh, of these two terms. Um, and also to be you know, aware that um, this kind of coupling um, has to be um, uh, also anchored deeply from, from the very beginning uh, throughout, even more so than anything within the indigenous knowledges. Um, and what that it looks like, I'm not, you know, is something that needs to be um, uh, discussed uh, uh, more. I am also interested in, um, in, in terms of um, operations, but then there's a side of me that um, um, wants to figure out and maybe this could be as how do you do reparations if you know reparations usually means that it's um within a particular institutional setting that you're trying to you know in a sense um what's happening at the museums with the museum workers i used to be a museum worker i was, I was a museum worker for over 20 years as a um you know um art installer and so i kind of understand that underpaid uh, and uh, you know uh, working uh, precariously, um, as opposed to working precariously right now as an adjunct, <laughs> it's a different type of precarity, right? Um, so that um, that kind of uh, shifting of in the belly of the beast, right? Uh, of you know working on these social um, um, elements that's always there in in the sense that you know Negri and Hart talks about. Um, this um, this this movement towards uh, um, uh, communism or uh, whatever you want to call it is here already, right? We all know we have a vision of what it means to be collectively uh, working socially in mutual aid and uh, in uh, in a kind of like you know um, uh, service to each other that kind of lifts the boat. We already know what that is. It's just as that's not the way most of the world is because we are in this kind of. Big a transactional or exchange value or surplus value uh, kind of um, uh, market mechanism, right? Um, so that that's actually what you brought up, Greg. It's really important that that stuff is kind of happening. So this, uh, you know, that kind of participatory, social engaged art aspects that some artists have been, you know, doing um, in the museums have somehow kind of uh, maybe uh, away from the deconstruction. So that's been kind of like, you know, there's a kind of rebuilding in, uh, internally in the interior. And um, is that going to be enough um, uh, for these institutions to change? Do we still have to deal with the, you know, the global art market? We still have to deal with art fairs. Uh, we still have to deal with, um, you know, uh, certain uh, folks that are able to accrue uh, really expensive, you know, pieces of artwork as, as capital, uh, tax write-offs, the toxic boards, um, you know, even if we get rid of, you know, those obvious ones within the whole system, it's still part of the system. Um, you know, they might have, a, you know, a visibly a clean, um, you know, uh, a kind of ethical slate, but does that mean, um, it's not just sort of collapsing back into this, uh, you know, putting things together in the same way with a, with a few, a few different, uh, which will become more like um, uh, social democracy, um, uh, you know, as opposed to um, uh, democratic socialism, which is also a way uh, towards um, eco-socialism, right? Uh, can I just say that um, if we were to expect uh, purism at all levels, we, we wouldn't build anything and then you know, movement building is about, it's a game of adding, not of subtracting. <laughs> and um, and in, as it comes to institution, many times activism has to translate into institution building. Uh, if not, th all the work, all the legacies are erased. And that's where like, I, I, I've seen it. Uh, I'm, and that's why it's so important, for example, institutions of color, the few that remain uh, to be saved, to be safe kept. Because, because then that's how we're erased from the archives. That's how we are erased from the narratives. <laughs> that's how uh, it, it's so, it, it's multi-positional and one, that's what I call, that, that's what I call real resistance. Is that you have to see it in a multi-positional way where uh, you, you work towards um, that, um, that connection. To me, that's what repair means. Finding those authentic connections and, and 
and, and maybe ecology is, is, is the way to see it. But if we're in the subtracting games, it's just a vicious circle. It's just cynicism. Yeah, it's a good point. I think we've also touched on the issue of the, of the function of the state here a few times, and it's too big a subject to get into at the end of this conversation. But I'd be curious to hear from each of you what you see is the changing potential role of the state. I mean, on the one hand, we had the demolition of the state by neoliberalism. We, you know, we've survived that to some extent. Then we have this shifting towards this ultra nationalist kind of version of the state. And then we have this kind of reemergence of social democracies, Biden, possibly in Brazil, hopefully with Lulu maybe getting back and, you know, and so forth. Um, is this the tug of war that Nandini did a beautiful graphic on with people pulling back and forth? You remember this image? Um, or are we really going through sort of a, a new appreciation of what we might need in a bigger political setting than just activist sort of modalities? <clears throat> Was that just too big, probably? <laughs> uh, maybe, can I just, um, I think I think what Libertad said is, is really important. I mean, don't, um, you know, I'm not a cynic. Um, the fact that I'm looking for and I'm connecting to the collectives is, uh, is uh, you know, is uh, that it's, it's a practice of, of thinking um, that something else can be um, uh, moved on to. I'm not sure about the, you know, as a, as a visual artist, I always start attracted that the additive aspects that I, it may not apply, but um, I don't think you can actually have one without the other. Um, you know, and, and just talking as an artist, uh, the subtractive is a very key element to any kind of um, uh, kind of a creative process or practice. Um, it's just a matter of just, you know, shifting things around. Um, but I, I like the, I, I mean, I like the idea of the additive aspect. Um, so why I brought that up was had to do with more um, um, uh, this uh, part of, uh, with, I guess it had to do with, um, with MOCA, um, the, the museum um, that we withdrew from. And, um, one of the things that was said um, in our discussions with a larger group was that uh, we, this uh, we meaning the, the G11 or G10, uh, depending on, on the, uh, the time, um, were being naive. Um, you know, and one model would be the Brooklyn Museum. We were being very naive to assume that um, we can um, have some sort of reckoning happening, happening institutionally. Um, that, um, you know, uh, and I, I only bring this up in terms, and I don't necessarily think you mean it this way, but it just triggered that um, thought that um, we're trying to be too pure um, in terms of our demands about the, um, uh, the museum uh, coming out. Um, and in some sense, um, uh, you know, we didn't take it as far as that. It, what, uh, who took it as far as the Jingfang workers? Uh, uh, you know, this, uh, um, the only unionized uh, restaurant in Chinatown that to, uh, uh, that um, uh, the, our uh, um, uh, Jonathan Chu, who is on the board at MOCA, happens to be the largest real estate owner in Chinatown and who happens to be um, owning that place. And he was also involved with that. So there's this kind of like, you know, uh, moving within the system that um, we're always kind of getting uh, uh, pushed back about, um, well, you know, this is the way you have to, you know, choose uh, the lesser evil. Um, it was pretty much this, this person um, who was connected to the, uh, the uh, art world in a, in a significant way said to us that was um, um, in discussion with us about uh, the money um, that, you know, you should be thinking about this cultural institution, you know, uh, Chinese in America. I mean, that's not, you know, this is a small place. They're struggling. They're trying to archive their history. They're trying to represent their history, um, you know, from uh, uh, you know from the past to the the present to the future, right? And the fact that they were going to archive our activism uh, against the museum was something that you know was like uh, being pushed into the future for whatever use they want to use it. So that's why I kind of like you know I I kind of um, uh, mentioned uh, that aspect of the institution itself. Um, because I think um, these institutions like capitalism is quite um, the ability to, to sort of move it around and rotate it and you know, uh, morph it into other things uh, is, so, is so easy um, 
And I don't know, and this is a question, I, mean, I don't know, I don't have that answer. And I want to go to where Walter McNola says, and I keep going back to that, is to, that it needs to be abandoned. But I don't, he didn't say how. <laughs> I mean, he, he did, but in terms of going straight to indigenous knowledges is where he would go. And uh, a lot of that doesn't have these archiving, because he was also questioning history. He's saying that the way we approach history of this memory of archives and documentation data is just part of that nation building uh, parts of your uh, that's associated with Eurocentrism, associated with the notion of the nation state, associated with the, the concept of the formation of the citizen, which is part of the nation state. And that's where you get, you know, the inside and the outside, who's included, who's not. So what he's interested in is in borders. Um, he thinks all the action is happening at the border. And I guess this is part of that kind of like, you know, multiverse aspect. Can, can and I, uh, yeah. Can I just jump in real quick, guys, because we only have a few minutes. And I think tacking right off of what Todd said, and hopefully it'll fit in with everything. Uh, this question of history, precisely, because in a certain way, each of you uh, embodies a certain kind of idea of history, an interest in history, the archive. Um, and I think that these conflicts and this tension that Todd brings up is very important, but how do you see history functioning? And that, of course, relates to pedagogy in your practice. Is it okay for me to ask that question? And uh, I was wondering if Nandini, maybe you could speak briefly about it because of your great book. And everything. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, there's archives and archives, I would say, and there's archives and counter archives. And I think if it may feel like a reactionary position to be in, but we do have to counter histories with other histories. Um, that is the kind of project that Greg, you um, took on many years ago as you placed those signs you know, all, all around the city. And I still feel like that struggle is nowhere close to over, but you know, what we've seen in the past few months, um, it's horrifying, like how uh, reactionary this nation is, and it's all just embedded in the psyche. Um, and, you know, we can, the four of us can sit here and think about, you know, what, how we would not even bother to talk about certain things, because we think it's all over and done with, and, you know, what next? And um, I come from two places, India, now in the United States and you know there's Modi there, there was Trump here. And so um, just looking at the ways we are spiraling backwards into these very nationalist fascist positions uh, on, on a scale, you know, I think we really have to continue to work at these other archives of finding ways to, as Liberdad said, make visible um, these alternative histories. So for me, that work is just the most important one. And it's also fueled, it, it shapes the way in which I think about my practice, which changes all the time, you know, which is not a kind of thing that stays static. It, it really flexes with this notion of like where we are going um, historically or as, as, as peoples, so. That's sort of my response. Well, my, 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 parallel, my quick parallel was in terms of the nation states and the borders is uh, into the world of art is that that happens also between artists and institutions. Right now, there's a great WPA project that just got unveiled today. Uh, God bless the new commissioner that made it happening of, of arts and culture. And that's great. It's about giving uh, or a CETA program to uh, making uh, artists work in the public sphere and, and uh, uh, works program. But there's a continuum with the institutions, especially the counter institutions that precisely create the landscape that feed the pipelines to a lot of those artists. So, so, so the, the, uh, those counter institutions, especially uh, cultural specific uh, organizations of color, they've been the ones that uh, in this digital divide, we have not been able to do the visibility because they don't have the marketing budgets because we don't exist because our uh, audiences that we serve are also the people that don't necessarily always have the digital marketing aspects of, of, of the serialized you know, collective. So uh, 
these are things that we 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 need to take into consideration as when, when we talk about institutions and, and those uh, like black and white dichotomies that you know we have to look at the continuum of of of, <laughs> of what the, the the reparation or the redirection is it's beautiful todd you have just a quickie final thing i, I put in the in the uh, chat maybe emily can forward it what uh libertad's talking about the announcement that came today todd mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm I I, I really appreciate the uh, conversation because I'm, as I said, I am uh, I don't um, uh, I don't have any um, you know final uh, wrap up of what I'm thinking. I'm actually it's it's a it's a practice in process, not progress, but is in practice and process, and uh, so I'm looking to see exactly how these um, uh, how collective practices can sort of reshape. Um, uh, what I am thinking in terms of what it means to abandon certain things. Um, and I guess what I'm just trying to uh, make sure is that I don't, um, you know, one of the things about uh, um, uh, Strike MoMA is that um, uh, during one of the discussions, I, I keep saying that um, uh, make sure that, um, you know, uh, this doesn't become some, some, some sort of oppositional counter side becomes part of, uh, part of the archive of the museum that they're gonna start wanting to collect and archives, right? So uh, museums are quite, you know, uh, savvy in this way that they will build all this, uh, build all this stuff into their their archive. Um, and uh, these archives are, you know, they're not neutral. They're, um, as somebody said, uh, in, uh, the talk I went to is that it's guarded. These are guarded archives. Um, and you know, they, uh, you know, MoMA has this, uh, the this, uh, um, and if Greg, I hope it's okay for me to bring this pad in the archives. I mean, this is, you know, PAD to me is like waiting to erupt. There, there needs to be a rupture <laughs> happening within those archives, right? Yeah. So it could be, it's not only PAD, there are lots of things that could be erupting. It's a huge um, amount of material. Yeah, from the, yeah, yeah, um, erupting from you're, these you're archives. You're talking about, uh, just, just for the audience sake, uh, PADD or PAD slash D, political art documentation distribution, whose archives are at, at the MoMA uh, and they represent, uh, a big chunk of time between the 60s and about the 90s of art and um, sort of political engagement. Uh, so listen, I think we, we're probably over a little bit and I, I think we should wrap up. I just wanna thank all of you for what should be a, 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 just the beginning of a very long series of discussions. Uh, but I will end with um, a, a note that uh, actually something that uh, uh, Todd brought up himself from Raoul Peck and that is that the past is a future we cannot anticipate. I just put that in the chat for everyone because it's, a, it's sort of a beautiful way, I think, to talk about everybody's work here, which is so incredibly important. Um, Emily, I think maybe, do you have some final words you need to bring in here? And thank you again, everyone, for, for being patient and letting us go over time a little bit. No more words other than thank you, everybody, and to check out Bar Graduate Center's website for more events. But thank you for being with us and thank you to all of our conversationalists tonight. Be Have well, night, everyone. everyone. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Greg. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Bye.